Hello, this is Candy from eyes2jesus.blogspot.com and I wanted to uh, put up a video and do a Bible study on Revelation chapter 12. As many people believe that uh, we are going to see the sign of Revelation chapter 12 in the stars uh, next month on uh, September 23rd, which is directly after Rosh Hashanah, which is an interesting uh, time. And we may or may not see it, and as that is something that time will tell. However, regardless if uh, September 23rd is Revelation 12 in the stars or not, it is indeed that and this month's eclipse are indeed calling Christians to remind us, get into the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. You don't just go to the Word of God for all the pretty, flowery, fluffy stuff that makes you feel happy and good to be a Christian. But you need to get in there as well and study prophecy. Study the wrath of God and why judgment is coming and, and why our righteous God um, holds off His wrath for as long as He does. Uh, we need to study the Word of God. So. Let's go through a Bible study of Revelation chapter 12 because most studies I have seen or heard on it are pretty surface level and I really think that we need a meat and potatoes study on Revelation chapter 12. So while most churches are giving you the milk of the word, I think uh, Christian brethren, let's uh, have iron sharpen iron and together let's you and I get into the meat of the word of God. So I just got... Um, a list of uh, notes and scriptures and points here sitting next to me to uh, remind me so I hopefully don't forget uh, certain things I want to mention. So first, uh, please get out your King James Bible. Please follow along with me. You need to look at this and study this for yourself. I'm just going to give you a jumping off point. I'm going to show you my studies and then I hope you will continue to study this on your own. Uh, to begin this study though, um, we need to establish a very important timeline. When does the Revelation 12 sign happen? Okay, and this is why it's possible that uh, September 23rd may not be the Revelation 12 sign because um, of the timeline of when it happens. Now, we could be missing certain things that have happened that we are unaware of because of media blackouts and etc. So, you know, that's why the Bible says, um, look up and see the sign of the Son of Man coming. And when you look up and you see the sign of the Son of Man coming, then you know that your redemption draweth nigh. So we look around and we see the signs of the times and we wonder, is this it? What about all the signs of the times that we're not seeing because of where we live in the world or because of media blackouts? Uh, stuff that we don't know has, has happened, but we don't know about it. But when we see the sign of the Son of Man coming, then we know that uh, our redemption brethren draweth nigh. So first let's establish a bit of a timeline. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 52. Alright, and that says, Behold, I show you a mystery, for we shall not all sleep, that means Christians death, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So uh, let's just focus in here on mystery, and it says the last trump. So is there a place in Revelation that talks about the last trumpet and a mystery? Yes. Let's turn now to Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, to sound the seventh trumpet, so when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So this mystery seems to be the rapture, all right? Uh, and that the rapture is happening at the last trumpet. And if you follow the timeline in Revelation, the last trumpet is three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation. All right, so it also says, uh, as he has declared to his servant the prophets, so this should be in the Old Testament too, and it is in several places. My favorite place to go is where we will go next. Let's turn in the Old Testament to Daniel chapter 12, and we will look at verses 1 through 2. 
Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 say, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. By the way, in the New Testament, the second half of the tribulation is referred to as a great tribulation in some places. In the Old Testament, the second half of the tribulation is often referred to as a time of trouble or Jacob's trouble. Okay, so there shall be a time of trouble, that's referring to the second half of the tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, so in the middle of the tribulation, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be written in the book. What book? The Lamb's Book of Life. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So I went to verse extra and went to verse 3, because I think that's absolutely amazing. So, if the rapture is in the middle of the tribulation and it's at the seventh trumpet, then shouldn't we see it in the seventh trumpet in Revelation? Yes, we do. Revelation 12, the sign in the stars, is in the middle of the tribulation. And in Revelation chapter 11, the seventh trumpet begins. So, and by the way, Revelation 12 is part of the seventh trumpet. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. Alright, and then we're going to want to do verses 11 through 15. This is the rapture. And it says... I'm sorry, I'm going to do 15 through 18. And the seventh angel sounded, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Wait, in the middle of the tribulation, now the earth is the God's kingdom again? Because recall, right now where we're at, this is Satan's kingdom. The Bible calls him the lowercase g, God of this world, who tries to prevent people from becoming Christians. All right, the uh, Bible clearly shows us that right now in the fallen state that this is Satan's kingdom and that Christians are here as strangers and pilgrims and ambassadors of Christ. You can look all this up for yourself. All right, uh, when Jesus fasted and was in the wilderness, Satan tempted him with, hey, why don't you rule over these kingdoms? I offer them to you. Why was Satan able to offer Jesus, who is God, the kingdoms of this world? Because currently in this fallen state, this world is Satan's kingdom. Christians, why are we called to let our lights shine? Because we are in a world of darkness. Jesus is the light, and Christians on this earth are the body of Christ on this earth. If we don't let our light shine, then what are we? We're part of the darkness. All right, so it's saying here at the seventh trumpet that the kingdoms of this world, Satan's kingdoms, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, continuing on. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. They are worshipping. There is a celebration. Verse 17, saying, We give thee thanks, thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. He's taken the kingdom back. Verse 18 continues, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Thy wrath is come. See, the, the, wrath, the Lord's wrath is the second half of the tribulation, which is way worse than the first half. That's why it's possible that uh, we could go through the first half of the tribulation and not necessarily know it, because we're not necessarily going to get every single thing that happens in there, depending on what part of the world uh, these events happen in, and media blackouts, etc. But the second half of the tribulation... We're talking about the sun going dark. We're talking about the sun going bright. We're talking about some extensive, freaky, scary stuff. It's way worse. Okay? But uh, Christians are not appointed unto wrath. And Christians are therefore raptured before thy wrath. Alright? So we're here for the first half of the tribulation, but not the second half. And thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead. Ooh, this sounds like Daniel chapter 12 and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, that's us. Saints and Christians are synonymous. And them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Uh, 
chemtrail people, look out. God's coming for you. All right. So there we have the rapture in the seventh trumpet in the middle of the tribulation. And why am I establishing this timeline? Because that was in Revelation chapter 11. The sign in the stars is Revelation chapter 12. Now, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets, the Bible calls them the three woes, okay? So the second woe ends in uh, verse 11, um, in chapter 11, verse 14, right before the seventh trumpet. So the woes are containers that mark out when each trumpet ends. Okay, so after the fifth, remember fifth, trumpets five, six, and seven, the three woes. When the fifth trumpet ends, it gives us a marker and uh, shows it when it ends. Um, let's see here. So, for example, Revelation chapter 8, um, uh, the second half of verse 13 says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are about the sound. All right, and then well, let me just take a little look here. All right, and then somewhere in there is the first woe. I'm not going to dig it out right now, but keep reading. You're saying this is the first woe. And then verse 14 in chapter 11, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. All right, and then the third woe, which would mark the end of the seventh trumpet, doesn't come until chapter 12, verse 12. So this means the sign in the stars, the wonder in the stars, is part of the seventh trumpet. So let's get into Revelation chapter 12, and let's get ready to eat a steak, because this is going to be meaty. All right, excuse me, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Okay, so first of all, is this the something that, um, that the Apostle John is seeing in his visions of the Revelation? Or is this going to be a sign in the heaven that we're all going to see? Okay, uh, if we look at uh, chapter 11, verse 19, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So that says, doesn't say it's a wonder in heaven, but it says the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. It doesn't say if it was a seen by him and those in heaven, or if we see it as well. If this is something that we're going to see as well, then uh, that could possibly be the eclipse coming up uh, this month on the 21st. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't really tell us who sees it. So this could be something that is just seen in heaven. Okay, uh, okay so verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So that's a sign in heaven that he saw, the seven angels getting ready to pour out the seven vials of wrath, which is the second three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. Is that something everybody's going to be able to see? No, I don't think so. It says, and I saw another sign. And here in the King James Version, it really is using the word sign. As to where in chapter 12, it's not, and I saw, and it's not, and it was seen. It's, and there appeared. All right, and what appeared? And there appeared a great wonder. So we're not being told that it's a sign. We're given the word wonder, and there appeared. He's not saying this was seen or I saw. He's saying there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now, the King James translators do give an alternate translation for wonder here being the word sign. But notice in chapter 15, verse 1, the translator said the word sign and not the word wonder. Why is that? Because there was a distinction there. These are two different things, okay? Uh, in chapter 15, verse 1, that was John the Apostle seeing that sign and reporting it to us. All right, in uh, chapter 11, verse 19, the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Okay, but in chapter 12, verse 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. So, this sounds like it's something that we're going to see. Um... If it is going to be via the Maseroth or constellation-wise, then the only time in the foreseeable future that we can tell, I mean, by running uh, Starshark software such as Stellarium, that this would happen, 
would be September 23rd, where we have the Virgin, the constellation Virgo, Jupiter. Jupiter is a protector of our planet. It protects our planets from major um, meteorite hits all the time. Uh, Jupiter representing uh, the body of Christ or the man-child, okay? And... Uh, and then the crown of 12 stars above Virgo's head. We have the constellation Leo there. Problem is Leo has nine stars. But Mars, Mercury, and Venus happen to line up in Leo, completing the crown, making it 12 stars. All right, she will be clothed with the sun because being September 23rd, the sun is going to be in Virgo, uh, zodiac-wise. And then the moon is going to be at her feet at that time. All right, and that... She's going to be travailing and being in birth and giving birth to a child. Well, Jupiter has been sitting in Virgo's womb for several months. After approximately a full-term human pregnancy length of time, Jupiter will come out of the womb of Virgo. And Jupiter starts coming out of the womb of Virgo. When the moon is at her feet and she's clothed with the sun and she has a crown of 12 stars on uh, September 23rd this year. So we see that constellation-wise. But... There is a way we'll find out if that's what chapter 12 here is talking about or not. And that's by if we see the next wonder that we're supposed to be. It's not, that's not the only wonder that's supposed to happen. There's another wonder, okay? So let's take a look at that really quick, all right? Okay, so let's start over with verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And we'll get into that in a minute. And uh, the celestial, possible celestial object... Uh, the Nibiru-like object that we've been tracking since we first spotted it September 27, 2016, is uh, heading straight towards Virgo and Jupiter right now. So, is that going to be the red dragon, or is it going to be something else? We need to have that red dragon there, and if it's a celestial body, this red dragon, it needs to have a near miss with Jupiter. So, if that second sign isn't there, then September 23rd is not Revelation chapter 12. All right, Revelation chapter 12, this could be instead something supernatural that happens. Or, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, maybe that appeared to John, and not, and it does not appear to us. Just like uh, in chapter 15, verse 1, all right, the appearance of the angels in the heaven, it appeared to John. Okay, so we'll get more into some of this in a bit, but let's look again at verse 2, okay? It says, And she, being with child, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth. So, is there going to be a sound that says she cried, travailing in birth? I mean, if the word cried wasn't there, then uh, I could see how uh, even more so September 23rd could be it. And September 23rd may very well still be it. But she cried. So are we going to have a sound that is going to occur during this time as well? Okay. Um, also, though, who is this woman, this virgin, which may or may not be the constellation Virgo uh, on September 23rd, if this is it? Who is this woman? All right. The Roman Catholic Church obviously must think that this woman is Mary because they have statues and pictures of her all over the place, all right, depicting Mary with a crown of 12 stars and the moon under her feet, okay? That's not who the woman is, okay? Uh, let's let Scripture interpret Scripture and let's find out who the woman is. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 through 8. All right, 66 being the last chapter, verses 7 through 8 says, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So I don't think this is referring to the Revelation 12 event, but it's using 
the same figures here. The woman who is travailing is Zion, and prophetically Zion is another name for Israel. Okay, so clearly the woman is not the Virgin Mary, and the woman is most definitely not the church. The church is in this uh, vision, uh, but it's not the woman. The woman is Israel as a whole. All right, so you have the woman is Israel as a whole. All right, and then, by the way, you can also confirm all this by uh, looking at uh, Joseph's vision that was very similar to this in one of his dreams in Genesis. Okay, so the woman is Israel as a whole, the nation Israel. The 12 stars on her crown represents the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, uh, we will get into uh, the man-child and, of course, the dragon and all that in just a few minutes. Okay, but the woman is Israel. So let's continue on. Let's read uh, verses 3 through 4 in Revelation chapter 12, which says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So this second wonder in heaven, this Nibiru object, or this dragon, it needs to, be, it needs to fit this description. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll wait and see uh, what happens. But let's compare verses 3 through 4 with uh, Daniel, chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. So Daniel chapter 8 verses 9 through 12 says, And out of one of them, and this is describing, by the way, the exact same event we just read in Revelation chapter 12, okay? And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed, ex waxed exceeding great, towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. The practicing and prospering really makes me think of uh, witchcraft and uh, using uh, spiritual demonic forces, by the way. But notice... And it, the little horn, it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. Uh, that just seems very familiar, it seems similar to uh, the tale of the dragon drawing a third of the stars and casting them to the ground. So some of the fallen angels, uh, Satan himself, cast to the earth uh, during that time. Not all of the fallen angels, because we will see... Uh, that in a few minutes, okay? So let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and continue on. Okay, let's go to verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. All right, this man-child that's not Jesus in the sense of uh, Jesus uh, being born of Mary on the earth. That already happened. That happened uh, approximately 2017 years ago, right? No, this man-child is the body of Christ. The body of Christ gets caught up to God's throne. Jesus didn't get caught up. He didn't get harpazoed, how we pronounce that Greek word, to God's throne. Okay, uh, that was... Um, Jesus was lifted. He went up in a cloud with lots of witnesses. Okay? But uh, it says here that this man-child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Alright? So, if this is going to be a literal sign in the stars, I don't know what that's going to look like for Jupiter. Okay? But I know that uh, the man-child of Zion slash Israel is the body of Christ. So if you are a saved, born-again Christian, that is you. That is me. We are the body of Christ on earth. And we are going to be caught up. This is a middle tribulation rapture, again, being restated here for us. Okay? So caught up unto God and to his throne. All right? And let me just uh, bring up blueletterbible.org on my phone here. All right. And then for, let's see here. 
And look up Revelation 12, 5. Okay, so caught up in the Greek is harpazo. Okay, uh, so harpazo is translated in the King James Bible as catch up, take by force, catch away, pluck, catch, pull. So harpazo means to seize, carry off by force, to seize on, claim for oneself eagerly, or to snatch out or away. So um, harpazo in this instance is referring to the middle tribulation rapture, the same event that we uh, read about in chapter 11 verses 15 through 18 of the book of Revelation. All right, so let's move on to verse 6 of chapter 12 in Revelation, which says, And the woman, remember this is Israel, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. All right, uh, this is the same thing that Jesus talks about uh, in the Gospels, such as uh, Luke 21, 21. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 21. All right, and uh, and that says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, wilderness, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Okay, so why? Because it says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Alright, so let's uh, jump back to Revelation 12, 6, and take another look at that in light of uh, Luke 21, 21. Revelation 12, 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Why? Because later in this chapter, we find out that the dragon goes after the woman. Okay? Uh, we will see that in a few minutes. And so the woman needed to escape. So the dragon is going to go after Israel, and Israel needs to escape into the wilderness. All right, let's move on with uh, verses 7 through 9. This is Star Wars now, the real Star Wars, not the motion picture. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, fallen angels, and prevailed not. So the dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. All right, and uh, this also, of course, is in various other places of the Bible. I'm trying to read my messy handwriting here. So let's go to Luke 21 again, and this time let's look at verses 25 through 26. All right. This is kind of an overview, okay? Verse 25, for example, is uh, just gives us a quick whoop of uh, a quick whoop of Revelation chapter 12, the sign in the stars. Okay, it says in verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Okay, so if Revelation 12 is going to be a sign that we're all going to see, that involves the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. Well, that's all happening right now. Okay, this is where it's going to get a little bit more interesting. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is the same time as the Star War. The Star Wars that we just read in Revelation chapter 12. This is the parallel and Luke chapter 21, it's the same thing. So when the devil and his angels are cast, remember it says they're cast to the earth, it says here, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Those things which are coming on the earth. That doesn't sound like it's just going to be Satan and his angels going blink, 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 and just landing on the earth. These are things coming on the earth. I mean, certainly there is going to be meteor showers, but that's not specifically what this is referring to. Let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 12. All right. Uh, and before we continue on, um, 
we need to discuss, and I'm, I'm just going to touch on this briefly because this is a whole other Bible study, uh, trans-dimensional vehicles of light. Uh, these are vehicles of conveyance that don't that are not just limited to our three or four known dimensions that we experience but traverse other dimensions as well these are what the world calls UFOs uh, they are vehicle conveyances uh, that both the good and bad angels use uh, mostly uh, I believe these days uh, it's the fallen angels in these vehicle of conveyances to uh, trick and deceive the masses. Try to get us to believe that we are here via evolution with some help from a benevolent alien race who seeded us to make us even more intelligent as we are today. Not quite correct. As we read in the Bible, um, yes, there was some seeding going on from an extraterrestrial source. But that seeding was the fallen angels, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, mating with the earth women and creating these half-breeds. Okay, um, I'm not eight foot tall uh, or taller, and I'm not a Nephilim. I'm, I am not a demonic half-breed. Therefore, while they did seed some on the planet, most of us walking around are not part of that serpent seed. That serpent seed was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We have two seeds prophesied there. We have the seed of the woman, which is Jesus, and then we have the seed of the serpent, which most churches glob over and won't even discuss or touch upon at all. All right, uh, let's see here. Let's move on to uh, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 here in Revelation, okay, which says... And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they, that's Christians, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. That's how Christians overcome the accuser. But now, at this point in Revelation, at chapter 10, he is cast down to the earth. Okay? Um, notice it says, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. There it is again saying, Oh, here comes the kingdom of our God. This parallels with Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, where again we have the picture of the middle tribulation rapture. Okay, so we're getting even more of a tight timeline of the Middle Tribulation Rapture. Let's go back really quick, though, in parallel with this passage we just read. Let's go back to Luke 21, and this time let's look at verses 27 through 28. All right, and they say, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. And lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. There is a middle tribulation rapture also right here in Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, we're following that portion of Luke 21 that goes along with Revelation chapter 12. Let me just give you a quick little um, key uh, to help in uh, your scripture study. If you're studying um, where Jesus is talking about the end of the world, etc., in Matthew chapter, four, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13, you need to parallel that with uh, Luke chapter 21. Because Luke chapter 21 gives us the timeline. It is the template. Uh, chapter 24 of Matthew and chapter 13 of Mark are not in chronological order. They are in subjective order. And so is uh, Luke chapter 21. But Luke chapter 21 is a bit more precise in the wordage of uh, giving us time phrases to let us know what order we're in. For example, Luke chapter 1 verse uh, 12, chapter 21 verse 12 starts with, but before all these. So I have um, an article I wrote years ago on this where I have tables and I compare uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 together using Luke 21 as a template to understanding Mark, Matthew 24 and Mark 13. So you can take a look at that. Uh, it'll be listed in the articles in the left sidebar of eyes to jesus.blogspot.com. But now let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and let's look at verses 12 through 17. So basically Revelation chapter 12 finishing out that chapter. 
Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Stop for a moment. Did you see the word woe? That's the third container. Boom! The third woe is Satan being cast to the earth. Because what does he do? He inhabits who the man, Antichrist. Okay, as so we'll see in a little bit. That's the third woe. Boom! That's where uh, the seventh trumpet ends. Okay? And what, so, but we're still in the middle of the tribulation here. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. He's going after Israel. All right, why is he going after Israel? Because at this point, uh, the Christian church has now been mid tribulation raptured. But, as we'll see in the scripture in a moment, we're not raptured until Antichrist is revealed as the wicked one, which means. This is a very tight timeline, and things are going to happen very fast, okay? Um, we're going to see Antichrist revealed as the wicked one for sure. Then we get raptured, and he can't even go after us. So instead, he is going after Israel. And to the woman, verse 14, were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, and to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Time, times, and half a time is prophetic speak for three and a half years. Now notice, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. If America is anywhere specifically in prophecy, it's right there. Okay, uh, it's very likely that uh, Trump had to become our president, thank God, that's who I wanted, uh, and not Hillary. Because um, when the armies are encompassing Jerusalem, if Hillary were our president, I'm fairly convinced that um, it would be a shameful event that our country would be part of those uh, armies encompassing Jerusalem, helping the dragon to persecute the woman. But Trump is our president, and with Trump as our president, we're not going to be part of those armies going after Jerusalem. We're going to be airlifting them out, the wings of a great eagle. We are airlifting them out to the place in the wilderness where they're supposed to go. All right, so uh, that's why prophetically it was important that Trump did become president. This could happen either in this term or the next term, or we're going to have another president um, that's going to be more like Trump and not like Hillary or Obama uh, when this happens. Okay, verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he couldn't get to Israel. So what did he do? Now he's going after people who became Christians after the rapture. People who uh, their eyes opened. They saw the truth, unfortunately a bit late, because now they're there for the great tribulation, the second three and a half years. That's where the rest of us, we only had to go through the first three and a half years the easy half compared to the second, and we were out of here. All right, um, now we also should touch into uh, a bit in chapter 13, but first, uh, let's look at a scripture that goes with this, okay? Um, a lot of Luke chapter 21 and a lot of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 are talking about the same thing that Revelation chapter 12 is talking about. So when studying, <coughs> excuse me, when studying Revelation chapter 12, make sure that you are paralleling that with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Luke chapter 21, because they're all three talking about the same event in the same time frame in the tribulation. Excuse me. So, I think uh, we spent a lot of time in Luke chapter 21, so uh, I think it's time to skedaddle over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, let's go ahead and just uh, do the whole section of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that is paralleling with the parts of Luke 21 that we read and that parallels with Revelation chapter 12. So that's going to be... Uh, verse 1 through 12, okay, which says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, okay, wait, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that could be referring to two different times. I mean, he's only got a second coming, but he's got a rapture before the second coming. All right, so the Bible describes the coming of Jesus Christ either as um, 
in a cloud, just him, or as lightning that flashes across the sky and he comes with an army. When he comes in the cloud, his feet don't touch the earth. When he comes as lightning flash and with an army, <laughs> he's on the earth and there is war. So which coming is it describing here? Staunch pre-trib rapturists who have their blinders on and refuse to take the word of God as way it says will try to say, oh, well, uh, that's got to be the second coming of Armageddon. And it is not because it says by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. When the rapture, middle tribulation rapture happens, he gathers us unto him. When he comes back the second time as lightning flashing, we're with him. Because the Bible says that after the rapture, we will ever be with the Lord. When he comes back to the earth and his feet touch the earth, we are with him. Okay, so this is referring to the rapture. So it's saying the topic of this section is the rapture. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, at letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So two things. One, so we know that the rapture in the Bible is called the day of Christ. Right? And he's saying, uh, we wrote this part of the letter for you. Don't be afraid that the rapture is imminent. It's going to happen any second, that the day of Christ is at hand. No, there's some things that need to happen first, so you still have time to tell people the gospel. If you have loved ones who aren't saved, you still have time to pray for their salvation and to tell them the gospel. You don't have to fear. Okay, um, so the day of Christ in the Bible refers to the rapture. The day of the Lord, that refers to Christ's second coming and the battle of Armageddon. Okay, so... Uh, I once attended a church where uh, the pastor was very staunchly pre-tribulation rapture and, uh, and he was doing a sermon on trying to prove pre-tribulation rapture so he tried to debunk 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 by changing the day of Christ to the day of the Lord. But when I looked it up and he said the Greek said it should be day of the Lord not day of Christ so I looked it up in the Greek and he was wrong. Okay, it says um, what is it, Christos, all right, it did not say, what is it, Lord in the Greek is like Kyrios, all right, so excuse my sloppy pronunciation, it said Christos there, not Kyrios, okay, so uh, it was a blatant lie, if you have uh, a pastor or a study Bible that says that it should say day of the Lord here, not day of Christ, they are lying, just go Strong's Concordance, blueletterbible.com, turn on the Strong's numbers, look up uh, cha 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look up the word Christ here in verse 2, and you can see it says Christos, not Kyrios. Okay, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. See, this has been repeated. Why? Because even then there was deception of, oh, well, Christ could come and gather us together to who him at any time now. I mean, we could be harpazzled at any second, dude. Uh-uh. And we're still, still people are being deceived by that right now. That's why I wonder if pre-tribulation rapture is a great deception. I believe it's part of the great deception. Don't be deceived, it says, by any means. So don't be fooled in thinking that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. Don't fall for it. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, middle tribulation rapture, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Apostasia. Apostasy is in the Bible. There's going to be apostasy, a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, until we've had a great falling away, which is happening now, and until the man of sin is revealed as a son of perdition, that's what we're waiting on. When that happens, then, then we can start realizing that rapture is imminent. Yes, the great apostasy, the great falling away is happening right now. Yes, most people in the world who call themselves Christians are going to hell. And yes, the way is narrow. Okay, Christianity is not a label. It's not a, oh, I'm going to pick this religion and I'm going to have that. Okay, Christianity is the way and it is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All right, uh, continuing on verse 4, uh, describing this son of perdition, it says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We don't necessarily need to have the temple mount rebuilt for that to happen. Um, 
it's not telling us that it's specifically the temple of God. We don't have a temple of God on earth. Let's get that clear. The scriptures in the New Testament talks about that the temple of God is made without hands, that Christians on earth are the body of Christ, and that we are the church. Church buildings are not scriptural. It's okay to have a specific building that you meet at for church services, but we are the church, not the building. So when it says that... He is sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There is no temple of God on earth. The, the veil that separated in the temple in the Old Testament times, that separated us from the Holy of Holies, that kept us from the access to God. When Jesus died on the cross, the scriptures tell us that veil was ripped right in half. We have direct access to God. The scriptures say that we are saints, we are kings, and we are priests. There are priests, temples... All of that is abolished. We are now the priest, with our high priest being Jesus Christ. Okay? So, when he is sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, he's sitting in a place that the world perceives as a temple of God. Food for thought. What's the one place in the world that, the, that most of the world perceives as a temple of God, and where there is a man sitting there on the throne who claims that he is in the place of Christ? That's going to be uh, Babylon. It's going to be the same place described in uh, Revelation chapters 17 and 18. And uh, Babylon, my friends, is not America. Okay? Babylon, my friends, is none other than Vatican Rome. In Vatican Rome, we have a man sitting on a throne, and it is a gilded fancy throne, in a place that is perceived by the world to be a temple of God, showing himself that he is God. For his title is Vicar of Christ, and vicar means in the place of People from all over the world. Remember, Antichrist and Babylon is, is a religious entity first and a political entity second. Most people forget the religious part is first. It is a religious, uh, religious entity that has strong political power. The richest entity in the world is Vatican City. Okay, I mean, the Vatican vaults uh, its untold riches. Okay. So, I am of the opinion that the Antichrist is the Pope. Whether it's going to be this Pope, or the next Pope, or another Pope, time will tell. But the Bible says, uh, especially in the first epistle of John, that there are already Antichrists. Okay, and Antichrists, plural, those are people who deny Christ, but that's also the Mystery Babylon Church. Mystery Babylon Church, we read its nasty thread all through the Bible. Um, the Roman Empire never fell, it just morphed into the Roman Catholic Church. I have many articles on that that uh, you can see with plenty of scriptures uh, on my blog. But continuing on with verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now, we need to have a short little reminder about pronouns. Okay, um, let's skip down to verse 7. Uh, where it says, On, uh, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That is not the rapture. That is not the Holy Spirit leaving the world. We have to keep our pronouns straight here. I have seen most study Bibles get this wrong, and I've never heard this preached properly in any church or sermon. I'm sure people have got it right somewhere. I know I'm not the only one. Okay, verse 6, and now ye know... Ye, that's the pronoun that's been being used in this whole chapter, meaning the church, us, ye, is our pronoun here. All right, but look at verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all. He is referring to Antichrist. So we need to keep our pronouns straight in this chapter. Ye is us, it's the church. He or him or various versions of he in, is the pronoun here referring to Antichrist. So verse 6, And now ye, us, know what withholdeth that he, Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of iniquity is mystery Babylon. Only he, Antichrist, who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is that? I can tell you exactly what that is because we just read about it in Revelation chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 21. All right, so letting is uh, another word uh, for uh, restraining or withholding. Okay, so um, only Antichrist who now restrains will restrain. 
until he be taken out of the way. What was, what's Antichrist restraining? All right. Well, Antichrist was restraining the church. All right, the, the Roman Catholic entity is not a Christian entity. It never has been. It is the unbroken continuation of the Roman Empire as prophesied in Daniel chapter 2. It is still the kingdom of iron, but now it is mixed with clay. We are in the feet of Daniel's statue, heading right into the ten toes right now as we speak. Okay, so... The Roman Catholic Church restrains the true body of Christ. Why? Why? Because most of the world thinks that the Roman Catholic Pope is the head of the Christian religion. Well, Christianity isn't a religion. We don't do any rituals to get into heaven. Jesus paid it all for us. Okay? So that differentiates true scriptural Christianity from any religion. All right? But... The Roman Catholic Church, by being Mystery Babylon, but claiming that it's Christian, and, and the world, we have presidents and kings from all sorts of countries, including our country, unfortunately, that um, makes pilgrimages or visitations to the Pope. Many of them bow to him. They cry in his presence. They kiss his ring. This, that's worship, and that is blasphemous. Okay? What are world political entities doing going to a world religious entity? Okay, America isn't Babylon, New York City isn't Babylon, England isn't Babylon, Vatican City is Babylon. It is described very clearly in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Okay, so the mystery of iniquity doth already work. All right, so the Roman uh, Catholic Church, I believe, is the mystery of iniquity working. Only he, the Pope or future Pope, who now letteth, restrained, will let, restrain until he be taken out of the way. How is he taken out of the way? He gets wounded in the head, as we read about in Revelation. Read about in Revelation, he gets wounded in the head, and he's expected to die. And all of a sudden, he has a miraculous recovery. That's when Satan got cast to the earth, and he possesses the Antichrist. And then that's the second half tribulation Antichrist, which is a whole other critter from the first half of the tribulation, because the Antichrist of the second half of the tribulation, well, this dude works signs, wonders, and miracles. So continuing on, so let's read verses 7 and 8 together. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, what did verse 3 say? says that uh, let no man deceive you by any means for that day rapture shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition all right then continuing verse 9 even him whose coming is after the working of satan with all power and signs and lying wonders lying wonders because these miracles and signs and amazing tricks he's going to be able to do once he's possessed by the devil are lying wonders because that's the great part of the great deception is to believe he is God. And maybe he's even going to come across and say that uh, we have all these aliens who seeded us and these fallen angels are going to come to us as gods. Maybe the uh, gods of old, the uh, Greek gods come back. All right, verse 10. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's how you go to hell. How do you go to hell? You go to hell by not receiving the love of the truth. How do you not receive the love of the truth? By denying Jesus Christ. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Even a bad thought or a white lie is a sin. Okay? Any sin, okay, is uncleanness and is unrighteousness with God. God let his son, Jesus Christ, die and Jesus paid for our sins. Why did it get dark for three hours right before Jesus' death? Because Jesus is the light of the world. And it got dark because at that moment during those three hours, he took all my sins, all of your sins upon himself and the light of the world was extinguished. And then he died. He paid for our sins. That's all you need to do is believe and receive. You accept that free gift of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for your sins. Receive God's Holy Spirit into your life. And if you are a truly saved, born-again Christian, then you know that the moment you believed and received, your life changed forever. 
at that point you become uh, metaphorically uh, using a scriptural example a Christian tree apple trees produce apples Christian trees produce Christian fruits and that's why Jesus said by their fruits you shall know them we have a lot of people walking around saying that they are Christians but they are not putting out Christian fruits verse 11 and for this cause God shall send them those who deny Christ strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned to believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness had pleasure in unrighteousness but we are bound to give things always to God for you etc that gets into verse 13 so that's going into the great deception that is going to happen these lying wonders and these strong delusions that God's gonna go ahead and let happen to the unsaved world because he has been calling to them calling to you if you're unsaved for years and years and years eventually he's gonna stop dialing your number alright um, I think that's probably a pretty good place to uh, wrap this up so basically Will September 23rd, 2017 be the Revelation 12 sign in the stars? If it is, then that would mean that we would have to be in the middle of the tribulation. If we are, well, there's a whole bunch of gaps in there that I haven't seen. I've seen a lot of things that can fit the first half of the tribulation, but I've seen a lot of things that are missing. Are they missing because they are being blocked from our knowledge and they are happening? Or are they missing because this is not it? One thing is for sure, we're not necessarily going to know for sure that we're in the first half of the tribulation because the Bible says that uh, we will look up and see the sign. Look up and see the sign of the Son of Man. And then we will know that our redemption draws near. So we are supposed to watch the sun, moon, and the stars. And when we get the sign of the Son of Man, beloved, we will know it. So if you weren't saved and right with God, time may be short. I suggest you change that right away.